Von Neumann rarely discussed extraterrestrial life or extraterrestrial intelligence. Terrestrial life and intelligence were puzzling enough. Niels Botticelli was less restrained. The conditions for developing organisms with many of the properties considered characteristic of living beings by evolutionary processes do not have to be similar to those prevailing on Earth, he concluded, based on his numerical evolution experiments at the IAS. There is every reason to believe that any planet on which a large variety of molecules can reproduce by interconnected or symbiotic autocatalytic reactions may see the formation of organisms with the same properties. One of these properties, independent of the local conditions, might be the development of the universal machine. Over long distances, it is expensive to transport structures and inexpensive to transmit sequences. Turing machines, which by definition are structures that can be encoded as sequences, are already propagating themselves, locally, at the speed of light. The notion that one particular computer resides in one particular location at one time is obsolete. If life, by some chance, happens to have originated and survived elsewhere in the universe, it will have had time to explore an unfathomable diversity of forms. Those best able to survive the passage of time, adapt to changing environments, and migrate across interstellar distances will become the most widespread. A life form that assumes digital representation for all or part of its life cycle will be able to travel at the speed of light. As artificial intelligence pioneer Marvin Minsky observed on a visit to Soviet Armenia in 1970, instead of sending a picture of a cat, there is one area in which you can send the cat itself. Von Neumann extended the concept of Turing's universal machine to a universal constructor a machine that can execute the description of any other machine, including a description of itself. The universal constructor can, in turn, be extended to the concept of a machine that, by encoding and transmitting its own description as a self-extracting archive, reproduces copies of itself somewhere else. Digitally encoded organisms could be propagated economically even with extremely low probability of finding a host environment in which to germinate and grow. If the encoded kernel is intercepted by a host that has discovered digital computing, whose ability to translate between sequence and structure is as close to a universal common denominator as life and intelligence running on different platforms may be able to get, it has a chance. If we discovered such a kernel, we would immediately replicate it widely. Laboratories all over the planet would begin attempting to decode it, eventually compiling the coded sequence intentionally or inadvertently, to utilize our local resources, the way a virus is allocated privileges within a host cell. The read-write privileges granted to digital codes already include material technology, human minds, and increasingly, nucleotide synthesis and all the ensuing details of biology itself. The host planet would have to not only build radio telescopes and be actively listening for coded sequences, but also grant computational resources to signals if and when they arrived. The SETI at Home network now links some five million terrestrial computers to a growing array of radio telescopes, delivering a collective 500 teraflops of fast Fourier transforms representing a cumulative two million years of processing time. Not a word or even a picture so far, as far as we know. Sixty-some years ago, biochemical organisms began to assemble digital computers. Now digital computers are beginning to assemble biochemical organisms. Viewed from a distance, this looks like part of a life cycle, but which part? Are biochemical organisms the larval phase of digital computers? Or are digital computers the larval phase of biochemical organisms? According to Edward Teller, Enrico Fermi asked the question, where is everybody? At Los Alamos in 1950, when the subject of extraterrestrial beings came up over lunch. Fifty years later, over lunch at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University, I asked a 91-year-old Edward Teller how Fermi's question was holding up. John von Neumann, Theodor von Karman, Leo Szilard, and Eugene Wigner, Teller's childhood colleagues from Budapest, had all predeceased him. 
Of the five Hungarian Martians who brought the world nuclear weapons, digital computers, much of the aerospace industry, and the beginnings of genetic engineering, only Edward Teller, carrying a wooden staff at his side like an Old Testament prophet, was left. His limp from losing most of a foot to a Munich streetcar in 1928 had grown more pronounced, just as memories of his Hungarian youth had become more vivid as his later memories were beginning to fade. I remember the bridges, the beautiful bridges, he says of Budapest. Although Teller served with von Neumann and German rocket pioneer Werner von Braun as one of the models for the composite title character in Stanley Kubrick's Cold War masterpiece, Dr. Strangelove, nuclear weapons in the hands of Teller are, to me, less terrifying than they are in the hands of a new generation of nuclear weaponeers who have never witnessed an atmospheric test firsthand. Teller assumed that I had come to ask him about the teller Ulam invention and provided a lengthy account of the genesis of the hydrogen bomb and of the fission implosion explosion required to get thermonuclear fuel to ignite. The whole implosion idea, that is, that one can get densities considerably greater than normal, came from a visit from von Neumann, he told me. We proposed that together to Oppenheimer. He had once accepted with the hydrogen bomb out of the way, I mentioned that I was interested in the status of the Fermi paradox after 50 years. Let me ask you, Teller interjected in his thick Hungarian accent, are you uninterested in extraterrestrial intelligence? Obviously not. If you are interested, what would you look for? There's all sorts of things you can look for, I answered, but I think the thing not to look for is some intelligible signal. Any civilization that is doing useful communication, any efficient transmission of information will be encoded, so it won't be intelligible to us. It will look like noise. Where would you look for that? asked Teller. I don't know. I do. Where? Globular clusters, answered Teller. We cannot get in touch with anybody else because they choose to be so far away from us. In globular clusters, it is much easier for people at different places to get together. And if there is interstellar communication at all, it must be in the globular clusters. That seems reasonable, I agreed. My own personal theory is that extraterrestrial life could be here already. And how would we necessarily know? If there is life in the universe, the form of life that will prove to be most successful at propagating itself will be digital life. It will adopt a form that is independent of the local chemistry and migrate from one place to another as an electromagnetic signal as long as there is a digital world, a civilization that has discovered the universal Turing machine for it to colonize when it gets there. And that's why von Neumann and you other Martians got us to build all these computers to create a home for this kind of life. There was a long, drawn-out pause. Look. Teller finally said, lowering his voice to a raspy whisper. May I suggest that instead of explaining this, which would be hard, you write a science fiction book about it? Probably someone has, I said. Probably, answered Teller, someone has not. <laughs>